Stephen Scarridge's Christmas by Frank R. Stockton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cottage Twas Christmas Eve. An adamantine sky hung dark and heavy over the white earth. The forests were connescent with frost, and the great trees bent as if they were not able to sustain the weight of snow and ice with which the young winter had loaded them. In a by-path of the solemn woods there stood a cottage that would not perhaps have been noticed in the decreasing twilight, had it not been for a little wisp of smoke that feebly curled from the chimney apparently intending every minute to draw up its attenuated tail and disappear. Within, around the hearth whereon the dying embers sent up that feeble smoke, there gathered the family of Arthur Tyrrell, himself, his wife, a boy and a girl. T'was Christmas Eve. A damp air rushed from the recesses of the forest and came, an unbidden guest, into the cottage of the Tyrrells and it sat on every chair, and lay upon every bed, and held in its chilly embrace every member of the family. All sighed. Father, said the boy, is there no more wood that I may replenish the fire? No, my son, bitterly replied the father, his face hidden in his hands. I brought at noon the last stick from the woodpile. The mother, at these words, wiped a silent tear from her eyes, and drew her children yet nearer the smouldering coals. The father rose and moodily stood by the window, gazing out upon the night. A wind had now arisen, and the dead branches strewed the path that he soon must take to the neighbouring town. But he cared not for the danger. His fate and heart were alike hard. Mother! said the little girl. Shall I hang up my stocking to-night? Tis Christmas Eve. A Damascus blade could not have cut the mother's heart more keenly than this question. No, dear, she faltered. You must wear your stockings. There is no fire, and your feet, uncovered, will freeze. The little girl sighed and gazed sadly upon the blackening coals, but she raised her head again and said, but, mother dear, if I should sleep with my legs outside the clothes, old Santa Claus might slip in some little things between the woollen and my skin. Could he not, dear mother? Mother is weeping, sister, said the boy. Press her no further. The father now drew around him his threadbare coat, put upon his head his well-brushed straw hat, and approached the door. Where are you going this bitter night, dear father? cried his little son. He goes, then said the weeping mother, to the town. Disturb him not, my son, for he will buy a mackerel for our Christmas dinner. A, a mackerel? mackerel, cried both the children, and their eyes sparkled with joy. The boy sprang to his feet. You must not go alone, dear father, he cried. I will accompany you. And together they left the cottage. The town. The streets were crowded with merry faces and well-wrapped-up forms. Snow and ice, it is true, lay thick upon the pavements and roofs, but what of that? Bright lights glistened from every window, bright fires warmed and softened the air within the houses, while bright hearts made rosy and happy the countenances of the merry crowd without. In some of the shops great turkeys hung in placid obesity from the bending beams, and enormous bowls of mincemeat sent up delightful fumes, which mingled harmoniously with the scents of the oranges, the apples, and the barrels of sugar and bags of spices. In others the light from the chandeliers struck upon the polished surface of many a new wheelbarrow, sled, or hobby-horse, or lighted up the placid features of recumbent dolls and the demoniacal countenances of wildly jumping jacks. The crop of marbles and tops was almost more than could be garnered. Boxes and barrels of soldiers stood on every side, tin horns hung from every prominence, 
and boxes of wonders filled the counters while all the floor was packed with joyous children carrying their little purses beyond there stood the candy stores those earthly paradises of the young where golden gumdrops rare cream chocolate variegated mint stick and enrapturing mixtures spread their sweetened wealth over all available space to these and many other shops and stores and stalls and stands thronged the townspeople rich and poor even the humblest had some money to spend upon this merry christmas eve a damsel of the lower orders might here be seen hurrying home with a cheap chicken here another with a duck and here the saving father of a family bent under the load of a turkey and a huge basket of auxiliary good things everywhere cheerful lights and warm hearthstones bright and gay mansions cosy and comfortable little tenements happy hearts rosy cheeks and bright eyes nobody cared for the snow and ice while they had so much that was warm and cheering it was all the better for the holiday what would christmas be without snow an inevitable entrance through these joyous crowds down the hilarious streets where the happy boys were shouting and the merry girls were hurrying in and out of the shops came a man who was neither joyous hilarious merry nor happy it was stephen scarridge the landlord of so many houses in that town he wore an overcoat which though old was warm and comfortable and he had fur around his wrists and his neck his hat was pushed down tight upon his little head as though he would shut out all the sounds of merriment which filled the town wife and child he had none and this season of joy to all the christian world was an annoying and irritating season to his unsympathetic selfish heart oh ho he said to himself as one after another of his tenants loaded down with baskets and bundles hurried by each wishing him a merry christmas oh there seems to be a great ease in the money market just now oh ho, ho. they all seem as flush as millionaires there's nothing like the influence of holiday times to make one open his pockets <laughs> it's not yet the first of the month tis true but it matters not i'll go and collect my rents to-night while all this money is afloat oh, ho. <laughs> and so old scarridge went from house to house and threatened with expulsion all who did not pay their rents that night some resisted bravely for the settlement day had not yet arrived and these were served with notices to leave at the earliest legal moment others paid up their dues with many an angry protest while some poor souls had no money ready for this unforeseen demand, and Stephen Scarridge seized whatever he could find that would satisfy his claim. Thus many a poor weeping family saw the turkey or the fat goose which was to have graced the Christmas table carried away by the relentless landlord. The children shed tears to see their drums and toys depart and many a little memento of affection intended for a gift upon the morrow became the property of the hard-hearted stephen twas nearly nine o'clock when scarridge finished his nefarious labour he had converted his seizures into money and was returning to his inhospitable home with more joyous light in his eye than had shone there for many a day when he saw arthur tyrrell and his son enter the bright main street of the town oh ho said stephen has he too come to spend his christmas money he the poor miserable penniless one i'll follow him so behind the unhappy father and his son went the skulking scarridge past the grocery store and the markets with their rich treasures of eatables past the toy shops where the boy's eyes sparkled with the delight which disappointment soon washed out with a tear 
past the candy shops where the windows were so entrancing that the little fellow could scarcely look upon them on past all these to a small shop at the bottom of the street where a crowd of the very poorest people were making their little purchases went the father and his son followed by the evil-minded scarage when the tyrrells went into the shop the old man concealed himself outside behind a friendly pillar lest any of these poor people should happen to be his tenants and return him the damage he had just done to them but he very plainly saw arthur tyrrell go up to the counter and ask for a mackerel when one was brought costing ten cents he declined it but eventually purchased a smaller one the price of which was eight cents the two cents which he received as change were expended for a modicum of lard and father and son then left the store and wended their way homeward the way was long but the knowledge that they brought that which would make the next day something more like christmas than an ordinary day made their steps lighter and the path less wearisome they reached the cottage and opened the door there by a rush light on a table sat the mother and the little girl arranging greens wherewith to decorate their humble home to the mute interrogation of the mother's eyes the father said with something of the old fervour in his voice yes my dear i have got it and he laid the mackerel on the table the little girl sprang up to look at it and the boy stepped back to shut the door but before he could do so it was pushed wide open and scarage who had followed them all the way entered the cottage the inmates gazed at him with astonishment but they did not long remain in ignorance of the meaning of this untimely visit. "'Mr. Tyrrell,' said Scarridge, taking out of his pocket a huge memorandum-book and turning over the pages with a swift and practised hand, "'I believe you owe me two months' rent. Let me see. Yes, here it is. Eighty-seven and a half cents.' two months at forty-three and three-quarters cents per month i should like to have it now if you please and he stood with his head on one side his little eyes gleaming with a yellow maliciousness arthur tyrrell arose his wife crept to his side and the two children ran behind their parents sir said tyrrell i have no money to your worst no money cried the hard-hearted stephen that story will not do for me everybody seems to have money to-night and if they have none it is because they have wilfully spent it but if you really have none and here a ray of hope shot through the hearts of the tyrrell family you must have something that will bring money and that i shall seize upon aha uh -huh. i will take this and he picked up the christmas mackerel from the table where arthur had laid it tis very little said scarage but it will at least pay me interest wrapping it in the brown paper which lay under it he thrust it into his capacious pocket and without another word went out into the night Arthur Tyrrell sank into a chair and covered his face with his hands. His children, dumb with horror and dismay, clung to the rounds of his chair, while his wife, ever faithful in the day of sorrow as in that of joy, put her arm around his neck and whispered in his ear, "'Cheer up, dear Arthur. All may yet be well. Have courage. He did not take the lard.' what always happens swiftly homeward through the forest walked the triumphant scarage and he reached his home an hour before midnight he lived alone in a handsome house which he had seized for a debt an old woman coming every day to prepare his meals and do the little housework that he required opening his door with his latch-key he hurried upstairs lighted a candle and seating himself at a large table in a spacious room in the front of the house 
he counted over the money he had collected that evening, entered the amounts in one of the great folios which lay upon the table, and locked up the cash in a huge safe. Then he took from his pocket the mackerel of the Tyrrell family. He opened it, laid it flat upon the table before him, and divided it by imaginary lines into six parts. Here, said he to himself, are breakfasts for six days. I would it were a week. I like to have things square and even. Had that man bought the ten-cent fish that I saw offered him, there would have been seven portions. Well, perhaps I can make it do, even now. Let me see. A little off here, and the same off this. So... At this moment something very strange occurred. The mackerel, which had been lying split open upon its back, now closed itself, gave two or three long-drawn gasps, and then, heaving a sigh of relief, it flapped its tail, rolled its eyes a little, and deliberately wriggling itself over to a pile of ledgers, sat up on its tail and looked at Scarriage. This astounded individual pushed back his chair and gazed with all his eyes at the strange fish. But he was more astounded yet when the fish spoke to him. Would you mind, said the mackerel, making a very wry face, getting me a glass of water? I feel all of a parch inside. Scarriage mumbled out some sort of an assent, and hurried to a table near by, where stood a pitcher and a glass, and filling the latter, he brought it to the mackerel. "'Will you hold it to my mouth?' said the fish. Stephen complying, the mackerel drank a good half of the water. "'There,' it said, "'that makes me feel better.' I don't mind brine if I can take exercise, but to lie perfectly still in salt water makes one feel wretched. You don't know how hungry I am. Have you any worms convenient? Worms? cried Stephen. Why, what a question! No, I have no worms. Well, said the fish somewhat petulantly, you must have some sort of a yard or garden. Go and dig me some. Dig them, cried Stephen. Do you know it's winter and the ground's frozen, and the worms too, for that matter? I don't care anything for all that, said the mackerel. Go you and dig some up. Frozen or thawed, it is all one to me. I could eat them anyway. The manner of the fish was so imperative that Stephen Scarriage did not think of disobeying, but taking a crowbar and a spade from a pile of agricultural implements that lay in one corner of the room, and which had at various times been seized for debts, he lighted a lantern and went down into the little back garden. There he shovelled away the snow, and when he reached the ground he was obliged to use the crowbar vigorously before he could make any impression on the frozen earth. After a half-hour's hard labour he managed, by most carefully searching through the earth thrown out of the hole he had made, to find five frozen worms. These he considered a sufficient meal for a fish which would scarcely make seven meals for himself, and so he threw down his implements and went into the house with his lantern, his five frozen worms, and twice as many frozen fingers. When he reached the bottom of the stairs, he was certain that he heard the murmur of voices from above. He was terrified. The voices came from the room where all his treasures lay. Could it be thieves? Extinguishing his lantern and taking off his shoes, he softly crept up the stairs. He had not quite closed the door of the room when he left it, and he could now look through an opening which commanded a view of the whole apartment. And such a sight now met his wide-stretched eyes. In his chair, his own armchair by the table, there sat a dwarf, whose head, as large as a prize cabbage, 
was placed upon a body so small as not to be noticeable, and from which depended a pair of little legs appearing like the roots of the before-mentioned vegetable. On the table, busily engaged in dusting a day-book with a pen-wiper, was a fairy no more than a foot high, and as pretty and graceful as a queen of the ballet viewed from the dress-circle. The mackerel still leaned against the pile of ledgers, and, oh, horror, upon a great iron box in one corner, there sat a giant, whose head, had he stood up, would have reached the lofty ceiling. A chill, colder than the frosty earth and air outside could cause, ran through the frame of Stephen Scarridge, as he crouched by the crack of the door and looked upon these dreadful visitors and their conversation, of which he could hear distinctly every word, caused the freezing perspiration to trickle in icy globules down his back. "'He's gone to get me some worms,' said the mackerel, "'and we might as well settle it all before he comes back. For my part, I'm very sure of what I have been saying.' oh yes said the dwarf there can be no doubt about it at all i believe it every word of course it is so said the fairy standing upon the day-book which was now well dusted everybody knows it is it couldn't be otherwise said the giant in a voice like thunder among the pines we're all agreed upon that they're mighty positive about it, whatever it is, thought the trembling Stephen, who continued to look with all his eyes and to listen with all his ears. Well, said the dwarf, leaning back in the chair and twisting his little legs around each other until they looked like a rope's end, let us arrange matters. For my part, I would like to see all crooked things made straight just as quickly as possible. "'So would I,' said the fairy, sitting down on the day-book, and crossing her dainty satin-covered ankles, from which she stooped to brush a trifle of dust. "'I want to see everything nice and pretty and just right.' "'As for me,' said the mackerel, "'I'm somewhat divided, in my opinion, I mean. But whatever you all agree upon will suit me, I'm sure.' "'Then,' said the giant, rising to his feet and just escaping a violent contact of his head with the ceiling, "'let us get to work, and while we're about it we'll make a clean sweep of it.' To this the others all gave assent, and the giant, after moving the mackerel to one corner of the table and requesting the fairy to stand beside the fish, spread all the ledgers and day-books and cash and bill and memorandum-books upon the table and opened them all at the first page. Then the dwarf climbed up on the table and took a pen, and the fairy did the same, and they both set to work as hard as they could to take an account of Stephen Scarridge's possessions. As soon as either of them had added up two pages, the giant turned over the leaves, and he had to be very busy about it, so active was the dwarf, who had a splendid head for accounts, and who had balanced the same head so long upon his little legs that he had no manner of difficulty in balancing a few ledgers. The fairy, too, ran up and down the columns as if she were dancing a measure in which the only movements were forward one and backward one, and she got over her business nearly as fast as the dwarf. As for the mackerel, he could not add up, but the fairy told him what figures she had to carry to the next column, and he remembered them for her, and thus helped her a great deal. In less than half an hour, the giant turned over the last page of the last book, and the dwarf put down on a large sheet of foolscap the sum total of Stephen Scarridge's wealth. The fairy read out the sum, and the woeful listener at the door was forced to admit to himself that they had got it exactly right. "'Now then,' said the giant, "'here is the rent list. Let us make out the schedule.' 
In twenty minutes, the giant, the dwarf, and the fairy, the last reading out the names of Stephen's various tenants, the giant stating what amounts he deemed the due of each one, and the dwarf putting down the sums opposite their names, had made out the schedule, and the giant read it over in a voice that admitted of no inattention. Hurrah! said the dwarf. That's done, and I'm glad. And he stepped lightly from the table to the arm of the chair, and then down to the seat, and jumped to the floor, balancing his head in the most wonderful way as he performed these agile feats. Yes, said the mackerel, it's all right, though to be sure I'm somewhat divided. Oh, we won't refer to that now, said the giant. Let bygones be bygones. As for the fairy, she didn't say a word, but she just bounced on the top of the day-book that she had dusted, and which now lay closed near the edge of the table, and she danced such a charming little fantasy that everybody gazed at her with delight. The giant stooped and opened his mouth as if he expected her to whirl herself into it when she was done. And the mackerel was actually moved to tears, and tried to wipe his eyes with his fin. But it was not long enough, and so the tears rolled down and hardened into a white crust on the green baize which covered the table. The dwarf was on the floor, and he just stood still on his little toes as if he had been a great top dead asleep. Even Stephen, though he was terribly agitated, thought the dance was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. At length, with a whirl which made her look like a snowball on a pivot, she stopped stock still, standing on one toe, as if she had fallen from the sky and had stuck upright on the day-book. Bravo, bravo, cried the dwarf, and you could hear his little hands clapping beneath his head. Hurrah, cried the giant, and he brought his great palms together with a clap that rattled the window panes like the report of a cannon. Very nice, very nice indeed, said the mackerel, though I'm rather div- Oh, no, you're not, cried the fairy, making a sudden joyful jump at him and putting her little hand on his somewhat distorted and certainly very ugly mouth. "'You're nothing of the kind. And now let's have him in here and make him sign. Do you think he will do it?' said she, turning to the giant. That mighty individual doubled up his great right fist like a trip-hammer, and he opened his great left hand as hard and solid as an anvil, and he brought the two together with a sounding wang. Yes, said he, I think he will. In that case, said the dwarf, we might as well call him. I sent him after some worms, said the mackerel, but he has not been all this time getting them. I should not wonder at all if he had been listening at the door all the while. We'll soon settle that, said the dwarf, walking rapidly across the room, his head rolling from side to side, but still preserving that admirable balance for which it was so justly noted. When he reached the door, he pulled it wide open, and there stood poor Stephen Scarridge, trembling from head to foot, with the five frozen worms firmly grasped in his hands. Come in! said the giant, and Stephen walked in slowly and fearfully, bowing as he came to the several personages in the room. Are those my worms? said the mackerel. If so, put them in my mouth one at a time. There, not so fast. They are frozen, sure enough. But do you know that I believe I like them this way the best? I never tasted frozen ones before. By this time the dwarf had mounted the table, and opening the schedule, stood pointing to an agreement written at the bottom of it, while the fairy had a pen already dipped in the ink, which she held in her hand as she stood on the other side of the schedule. 
Now, sir, said the giant, just take your seat in your chair, take that pen in your hand, and sign your name below that agreement. If you've been listening at the door all this time, as I believe you have, you have heard the contents of the schedule, and therefore need not read it over. Stephen thought no more of disobeying than he did of challenging the giant to a battle, and he therefore seated himself in his chair, and taking the pen from the fairy, wrote his name at the bottom of the agreement although he knew that by that act he was signing away half his wealth. When he had written his signature, he laid down the pen and looked around to see if anything more was required of him. But just at that moment, something seemed to give way in the back of his neck. His head fell forward so as to nearly strike the table, and he awoke. There was no longer a schedule a fairy, a dwarf, or a giant. In front of him was the mackerel, split open and lying on its back. It was all a dream. For an hour Stephen Scarridge sat at his table, his face buried in his hands. When at last his candle gave signs of spluttering out, he arose, and with a subdued and quiet air he went to bed. What must occur? The next morning was bright, cold, and cheering, and Stephen Scarridge arose very early, went down to the large front room where his treasures were kept, got out his cheque book, and for two hours was busily employed in writing. When the old woman who attended to his household affairs arrived at the usual hour, she was surprised at his orders to cook for his breakfast the whole of a mackerel which he handed her. When he had finished his meal, at which he ate at least one half of the fish, he called her up into his room. He then addressed her as follows. Margaret, you have been my servant for seventeen years. During that time I have paid you fifty cents per week for your services. I am now convinced that the sum was insufficient. You should have had at least two dollars, considering you only had one meal in the house. As you would probably have spent the money as fast as I gave it to you, I shall pay you no interest upon what I have withheld. But here is a cheque for the unpaid balance, $1,326. Invest it carefully, and you will find it quite a help to you. Handing the paper to the astounded woman, he took up a large wallet stuffed with cheques and left the house. He went down into the lower part of the town with a countenance full of lively fervour and generous light. When he reached the quarter where his property lay, he spent an hour or two in converse with his tenants, and when he had spoken with the last one, his wallet was nearly empty, and he was followed by a wildly joyful crowd who would have brought a chair and carried him in triumph through the town had he not calmly waved them back. When the concourse of grateful ones had left him, he repaired to the house of Philip Weaver, the butcher, and hired his pony and spring cart. Then he went to Ambrose Smith, the baker, at whose shop he had stopped on his way down town, and inquired if his orders had been filled. Although it was Christmas morning, Ambrose and his seven assistants were all as busy as bees, but they had not yet been able to fill said orders. In an hour, however, Ambrose came himself to a candy store, where Stephen was treating a crowd of delighted children, and told him all was ready and the cart loaded. At this, Stephen hurried to the baker's shop, mounted the cart, took the reins, and drove rapidly in the direction of the cottage of Arthur Tyrrell. When he reached the place, it was nearly one o'clock. Driving cautiously as he neared the house, he stopped at a little distance from it and tied the horse to a tree. 
Then he stealthily approached a window and looked in. Arthur Tyrrell sat upon a chair in the middle of the room, his arms folded and his head bowed upon his breast. On a stool by his left side sat his wife, her tearful eyes raised to his sombre countenance. Before her father stood the little girl, leaning upon his knees and watching the varied expressions that flashed across his face. By his father's right side, his arm resting upon his parent's shoulder, stood the boy, a look of calm resignation far beyond his years, lighting up his intelligent face. "'Twas a tableau never to be forgotten. Able to gaze upon it but a few minutes, Stephen Scarridge pushed open the door and entered the room. His entrance was the signal of consternation. The wife and children fled to the farthest corner of the room, while Arthur Tyrrell arose and sternly confronted the intruder. Ha! said he, you have soon returned. You think that we can be yet further despoiled? Proceed, take all that we have. There is yet this. And he pointed to the two cents worth of lard, which still lay upon the table. No, no, faltered Stephen Scarridge, seizing the hand of Arthur Tyrrell and warmly pressing it. Keep it, keep it. "'Tis not for that I came, but to ask your pardon and to beg your acceptance of a Christmas gift. Pardon for having increased the weight of your poverty, and a gift to celebrate the advent of a happier feeling between us. Having said this, Stephen paused for a reply. Arthur Tyrrell mused for a moment. Then he cast his eyes upon his wife and his children, and in a low but firm voice he said, I pardon and accept. That's right, cried Scarridge, his whole being animated by a novel delight. Come out to the cart, you and your son, and help me bring in the things, while Mrs. T and the girl set the table as quickly as possible. The cart was now brought up before the door, and it was rapidly unloaded by willing hands. From under a half-dozen new blankets, which served to keep the other contents from contact with the frosty air, Stephen first handed out a fine linen tablecloth, and then a basket containing a dinner set of queensware, third class, seventy-eight pieces, with soup tureen and pickle dishes, and a half-dozen knives and forks, rubber-handled and warranted to stand hot water. When the cloth had been spread and the plates and dishes arranged, Arthur Tyrrell and his son, aided now by the wife and daughter, brought in the remaining contents of the cart and placed them on the table, while with a bundle of kindling which he had brought and the fallen limbs which lay all about the cottage, Scarridge made a rousing fire on the hearth. When the cart was empty and the table fully spread, it presented indeed a noble sight. At one end a great turkey, at the other a pair of geese, a duck upon one side and a pigeon pie upon the other, cranberries, potatoes, white and sweet, onions, parsnips, celery, bread, butter, beets, pickled and buttered, pickled cucumbers and walnuts and several kinds of sauces made up the first course, while upon a side table stood mince pies, apple pies, pumpkin pies, apples, nuts, almonds, raisins, and a huge pitcher of cider for dessert. It was impossible for the Tyrrell family to gaze unmoved upon this bounteously spread table and after silently clasping each other for a moment, they sat down with joyful, thankful hearts to a meal far better than they had seen for years. At their earnest solicitation, Mr. Scarridge joined them. When the meal was over, and there was little left but empty dishes, they all arose, and Scarridge prepared to take his leave. "'But before I go,' said he, 
I would leave you with a further memento of my good feeling and friendship. Uh, you know my Hillsdale farm in the next township. Oh, yes, cried Arthur Tyrrell. Is it possible that you will give me a position there? I make you a present of the whole farm, said Scarridge. There are two hundred and forty-two acres, sixty of which are in timber, large mansion house, two good barns, and cow and chicken houses, a well covered in, an orchard of young fruit trees, and a stream of water flowing through the place. The estate is well stocked with blooded cattle, horses, etc., and all necessary farming utensils. Possession immediate. Without waiting for the dumbfounded Tyrrell to speak, Scarridge turned quickly to his wife and said, "'Here, madam, is my Christmas gift to you. In this package you will find shares of the New York Central and Hudson, sixes of eighty-three, of the Fort Wayne, guaranteed, and of the St. Paul's, preferred, also bonds of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western second mortgage, and of the Michigan 7% war loan. In all, these amount to $9,082, but to preclude the necessity of selling at a sacrifice for immediate wants, I have taken the liberty of placing in the package $1,000 in greenbacks. And now, dear friends, adieu. But the grateful family could not allow this noble man to leave them thus. Arthur Tyrrell seized his hand and pressed it to his bosom, and then, as if overcome with emotion, Mrs. Tyrrell fell upon her benefactor's neck, while the children gratefully grasped the skirts of his coat. With one arm around the neck of the still young, once beautiful and now fast improving Mrs. Tyrrell, Stephen Scarridge stood for a few minutes, haunted by memories of the past. Then he spoke. Once, said he, his voice trembling the while, once I too loved such a one. But it is all over now, and the grass waves over her grave. Farewell, farewell, dear friends. And dashing away a tear, he tore himself from the fervent family and swiftly left the house. Springing into the cart, he drove rapidly into the town, a happy man. Did you ever read a story like that before? End of Stephen Scarridge's Christmas by Frank R. Stockton Recording by Ruth Golding Christmas 2013